Well, I'll get started. So hey everyone, my name's Paul Cotting. Uh, I am a, a product manager at Hortonworks. So I've been with Hortonworks for almost four years. I used to be in the field engineering or solutions engineering department. And so I work with a, a great deal of our customers to help them go to production, get live, be successful at scale. And I, see you later guys. <laughs> Wrong room, no worries. That was quick, yeah. Um, so what we're gonna do is basically, I wanna kinda introduce the, what is smart science? Effectively, that's kind of the product that, uh, that we've created. And I'm just gonna spend basically two minutes on the introduction, then we can kind of get started. What SmartSense does effectively is capture diagnostic information from our, cl our customers' clusters. We take that in, we actually produce recommendations off of that data, and then we give those recommendations to our customers. So what I wanted to spend kind of the meat of the conversation talking about are really what are the things that we've observed from um, actually processing those specific um, bundles and what recommendations have we come up with? What are some of the operational challenges? And so what are some of the issues that we see as being common issues that our operators make in production, if that makes sense? So what I wanted to do is just kind of start with a high level. This is how the product actually functions. This is how we get that diagnostic data. So SmartSense is deployed with Ambari. It works, there's a server and an agent. The agents actually capture diagnostic information like configuration, metrics, and logs for each of the nodes that we have within the cluster for all the common services. They pack that information up into a single file. That file sent to us. We analyze it, make recommendations, and give that to our customer as kind of like a punch list of these are all the problems that we found, either with configuration or with actual hardware itself. And these are the things that we would like you to do about it, if that makes sense. And so that's really where we get these bundles. And so we process uh, a, a large amount of data and myself, my engineering lead, Sheila Dolas, what we, what we do is we basically review each of those recommendations before they go out to our customers. And that's given us a lot of insight onto what are some of the things that people commonly get wrong, what are some of the common mistakes, et cetera. And we're gonna walk through those next. But what I want to start with is just kind of get a poll. How many of you guys are actually operating in a Hadoop cluster today? Great. And how long have you guys been doing that? Meaning like, is it, how, long, how many of you have been doing that job for more than six months? More than a year? More than two years? Excellent, excellent, sounds good. So we're gonna go through some of the kind of the top things. The one thing I wanted to start out with first is just kind of reminding everyone that every single individual node counts. What I mean by that is Hadoop can do a very good job at dealing with disks failing, dealing with nodes failing, dealing with top of rack switches failing, but the kind of the best thing that can happen is that machine goes out of commission, right? The worst thing that can happen is it can turn into a laggard node in which it's every single task is taking longer than it should. Uh, you know, it's just basically kind of gumming up the works effectively. That can protract your job run times and that can be extremely difficult to diagnose and debug. And so I wanted to start with those types of things. What are some of the common configuration issues at a per node level that can cause issues that are really hard to identify? The first thing we're gonna focus on is kind of like configuration inconsistencies at the operating system level. So I know many of you guys work in organizations where there's a lot of different teams that deal with different aspects of the Hadoop cluster. Networking team, hardware operations team that gives you guys basically a server and an OS. And there's a lot of expectations or maybe assumptions that are made to say that they're gonna do the right thing, their configuration is gonna be consistent, same kernel version, same kernel modules, same drivers, et cetera. But one of the things that, um, that we've seen that can be, you know, that can kind of throw that off is specific configurations at the operating system level that are inconsistently set. So maybe the first generation of hardware that you have, the first 50, the first 100 nodes have been configured one way, and then the, the other nodes that trickle in afterwards have different operating system configurations that can cause problems. This is one specific issue, locale being inconsistent across the individual servers that can cause uh, a lot of difficult to diagnose issues. So this is something that did happen to one of our customers. They had um, their locale set consistently across, I would say about three quarters of the nodes, but then the other quarter of the nodes had the locale incorrectly set, meaning there was, a, there was a difference there. And where that matters is in things like Hive, specifically some of the time-based functions that use the default locale on the operating system to identify what the date is. So specific operators like Unix timestamp and current date, where that actual task is running on that specific machine, when that task runs and that um, invocation to the JDK is made to get the date or do a date format operation, it's gonna use whatever locale that specific machine is set to. So what can, what can be the result, or what's you know, kind of the output uh, when these locales are wrong is important queries like this, if you're querying for sales data, specifically with time bounds, can be inconsistent or incorrect. 
depending on where the actual tasks run on which individual machine, if that makes sense, right? So some machines are gonna say, this data is from the one day, whereas other machines are gonna say, I'm gonna query the data from a different day, right, it crosses day boundaries. So this is uh, something that was really hard to diagnose. The customer had, you know, hey, there's inconsistencies with my specific SQL reports. Some of these reports, sometimes it's correct, sometimes the data is incorrect. In this case, when we kind of dug down into the weeds, it was really just the locale was set incorrectly on some of the machines. So this is one thing that's important to make sure is consistent across every single node in the cluster. The other thing is actually uh, a Linux kernel ca capability called transparent huge pages. So basically, pages are how the Linux kernel manages memory, and the page size could be like 4,096 bytes. But in more recent kernel versions, they give you the ability to have larger memory page sizes. And transparent huge pages is basically an abstraction that says the application doesn't need to worry about how big the pages are. It will handle you know, giving the application larger memory page sizes. In older versions of the Linux kernel, this seems like a pretty innocuous setting, something that might help you from a performance perspective. But in Red Hat and CentOS, basically 6.5 and previous, this caused an immense performance pro uh, impact on Hadoop clusters. In this case, I wanted to show you guys a graph here. In the graph, the red is system CPU and the blue is user. And you can see in the left-hand side of the graph, there's an inordinate amount of system CPU being utilized, which is not normal, right? Effectively, the amount of system CPU is swamping out our processes, like actual node manager processes that are actually running workload. And how this can kind of present itself is, if you have a kernel that's affected by this behavior, a lot of your data nodes will basically stop responding. Node managers will stop responding. The operating system seems like it's extremely bogged down, even though there's not a lot of user CPU. So looking at the box, it doesn't seem like, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, but we've seen it in yeah, 6.5 and previous we saw is affected. Past that, newer versions of CentOS and, OA and Red Hat are not affected by this. You're right. Yep. Yep. But why this is important is because if you have this setting incorrectly set across, you know, there's maybe set on some nodes and not others, it can be really hard to diagnose, you know, variances in job execution time as well as, you know, like I said, data nodes going offline. It just seems like why is, you know, what's going on in this machine? So THP is one of those things that we've identified as being a problem, and this is something that you want to make sure if you have the affected version of CentOS, you disable, just because it's, like I said, hard to diagnose um, and what's wrong. So in this case, the entire cluster had THP enabled. Um, at this point in time, THP was actually disabled. So you can see the same job running, the system CPU goes down, the amount of network activity we have, effectively the amount of data we're able to process in this case uh, goes up significantly. The other things are just kind of basic, basic operating system best practices, such as the name service cache daemon or SSSD in, in newer versions of uh, Red Hat and CentOS. So one of the things that happens quite often in a Hadoop cluster is a lot of um, activity related to identifying what specific groups a user is in, specifically on the name node. So each different HDFS file operation needs to resolve and say, okay, this user is trying to access a specific file. What groups are they in? So it can identify if it's a, you know if they're adequately authorized to be able to see that specific data. And so there's a lot of round trips to the operating system to go get that information. So caching things like user ID lookups, group ID lookups, group name, username lookups, using components like NSCD or SSSD can be a huge benefit. Same thing with DNS resolution. Especially in Kerberos clusters, there's a lot of DNS activity, a lot of round trips to the DNS server to identify, you know, effectively resolve an IP from a host name. And so having a caching layer on the operating system can make a big difference. So in this case, um, within the tool, we basically, for every single node, we try to resolve every other node and then record the amount of time it takes to do that resolution and complete that resolution. So in this case, this is the output of a machine that has NSCD turned on with caching enabled. Effectively, it's, you know, sub-second lookups for DNS. And this is another machine in the cluster that does not have NSCD enabled and configured to cache, right? So these are in milliseconds, but it's one of those things that just adds up. It's just one of those things, a misconfiguration that can add up over time. So NSCD, SSSD, important things that have enabled just so you can have that caching layer to uh, reduce the latency for critical lookups. Make sense? Any questions? Go ahead.
Yeah, so I mean, going down the Etsy host path, you're effectively short-circuiting these types of lookups, right? But I mean, the majority of our customers are going to be using you know, something like LDAP with SSSD to do their user and group resolution. And um, they're going to be using their centralized DNS infrastructure instead of ETC hosts. But if you kind of went down the brute force path and put everything in Etsy hosts, it's going to be more performant from a group, uh, I would say from a DNS resolution standpoint. But you're still going to pay the penalty when it comes to round tripping out, either shelling out to the operating system and the operating system going to PAM, PAM going out to LDAP to try to identify group and user resolution. So this is kind of like the one stop shop for both. Yep. Yeah, NTPD, everyone should be like, seriously, but this happens, right? This is something where it should be kind of obligatory that this is set up and configured to talk to a pool of NTP servers, but stuff happens, right? Firewall rules aren't set up for port 123 or the pool is incorrectly configured or something of that nature. And what can happen is, you know, you have a set of 50 servers and five of them for whatever reason aren't getting their time synchronized and SKU can kind of build up and build up and build up over time until you finally start seeing things like region servers tipping over or Kerberos operations failing because the time skew is too great. So log files like this, in this case, this is from a region server. It can't start up because the time skew between itself and the HBase master is too great. So time skew are things that just sneak up on you. If it's misconfigured, it could take a month, it could take a week, it could take two months, and all of a sudden that thing is just off enough for services to start dying. Same thing with Kerberos. So Kerberos, during the pre-authentication, needs to ensure that times are close enough, otherwise tickets will expire. Um, and so this is something you would see if you were trying to do a can it with the key tab and the time's off too much. So different indicators showing you that, hey, NTP is important. Make sure your time's in sync. The next thing is also kind of what I would consider a legacy kernel issue. These are specific network interface cards, specific kernel modules for specific kernel versions that we've seen to cause great impact from a performance perspective. This is something that's in the Red Hat knowledge base, 20278. I stole a lot of information from that. But we've seen this in customer clusters where effectively you never are able to achieve even close to wire speed when it comes to TCP traffic. So data node to data node communication, DFS client to data node, et cetera. And this is something that's important just to check. Most modern versions of CentOS and Red Hat aren't affected by this, but we still have a lot of customers maybe using older AMIs in AWS or older infrastructure that are still affected by these types of things. So important to check as it's a big performance thing and, and yet another thing that's just really hard to troubleshoot. That makes sense. Any questions on this? Cool. So that's that kind of leaves us at these are individual kind of individual node specific OS specific things that can make a, a pretty significant impact overall when it comes to problems in the cluster, performance issues. But now I kind of want to focus on the core software itself. So once you have the operating system sorted, what are some things within HDFS and Yarn that we think are important to note? So we'll start with name node configuration. So just like NSCD or SSSD. The name node can be configured to um, look up group memberships in multiple different ways. So there's different providers that you can use. In this case, there's a shell-based Unix group mapping. So the name node will shell out to Unix to try to resolve for a given user that's trying to access a file, what groups are they a member of. There's LDAP group mapping. So instead of going to the operating system, it can go to LDAP and try to do a, a you know, LDAP search to resolve the list of groups a specific user is a member of. There's composite group mapping, which allows you to basically merge the two together. So if you have a pretty complex organization, maybe you have multiple different uh, directories, or you have some local users and a mix of LDAP users, you can use composite. But in, in either way, a lot of users are going to be using something like SSSD or PAM LDAP or PAM Kerberos or something of that nature, especially in a Kerberos environment, to integrate their individual machines to whatever corporate directory they have. And so that user and group information is usually stored somewhere else. So instead of using the shell-based Unix group mapping, which would basically use something like SSSD to do the actual um, user to group mapping, we would recommend the JNI-based Unix group mapping with fallback. What that means is if we can, uh, we'll detect to see if JNI is available on the machine, and we'll use uh, the Java native interface to actually do the group lookup instead of shelling out to Unix, which it, it, it's one of those things where if you look at a busy cluster, if you guys have a busy cluster, you look at your HDFS audit log, it's extremely chatty. There's just a lot of DFS traffic. And each one of those operations means it needs to resolve, you know, who's, who's uh, what, for the given user, what groups they have. So using JNI instead of shelling out is something that also has a good performance uh, increase. The other thing from a name known perspective is the metadata directories themselves. 
So this specific property, the DFS name node named her, controls, it's a comma separated list of the different directories that FS image data should be stored to. If there's more than one directory, the data will be replicated across those directories. And with name node HA, this is less, a little bit less important, but it's still something that we recommend having multiple different directories within this specific property so that data is replicated more as an insurance kind of mechanism to make sure that if you have a RAID array, this is fine to have a single thing, but usually the other or the second most common uh, entry within this specific property is like an NFS mount. But you had a question. Um, in this case, I don't have any performance metrics, but it's more recommendations on if you are using NFS for this specific directory, how you should mount that NFS mount point. So there's, you know, when you're mounting NFS directories, you can mount them as soft mount or hard mount with different timeouts. We've seen issues with hard mounting um, NFS because what happens with that is effectively if those specific IO operations to the NFS mount timeout or it's unreachable, that's effectively like a blocking operation which means that the name node's trying to actually update the FS image data. It's trying to replicate it across both those directories, and if it can't get data to that NFS mount, it can cause significant problems to the name node. So that's why we would recommend soft mounting that and then specifying a specific timeout that allow it to degrade a little bit more gracefully and actually keep moving if that NFS mount disappears, if that makes sense. Yep. The name node handler count. So this is something that is, is, is not, we don't have, I would say necessarily a prescription to say it should always be set to X, but this is something that needs to kind of scale with the cluster itself. So what we see with our customers is there's a lot of configuration issues that are just related to the clusters installed, I got 50 nodes, I'm going to, you know, ten, you know I'm adding 10, 20, 30, whatever, up into 200, 250, and there's specific properties that need to scale along with node count. So this is the calculation that we recommend for scaling this specific property to make sure that there's enough handlers available for data node communication. Go for it. Yeah, on the regarding previous slide, yep. I usually put uh, in all circumstances an all number of nodes 128. Uh, what's the penalties of too high? Yeah, the penalty of a, a handler count that's too high is effectively memory pressure on the name node, right? If it's, if it's too low, you'll have performance in impact. If it's too high, you could run into out of memory scenarios or running out of file handlers on the name node, things of that nature. If I have like 16K file handlers open for user HDFS and I have a port of the device. Yeah, I, I think you might be talking about max transfer threads in the data node. Yeah, we'll talk about that next. Yep. Is there, is there a specific matrix, mechanics, matrix to monitor um, annual uh, wait time? Yeah, I'm, I... Anna might know, she's in the back. Um, I don't remember. There are a lot of JMX metrics exposed in the name node. I don't know if there's a current or a high threshold JMX metric for this. That's a good question, but I'll find out. Um, the other thing is something that we, we've recently identified. So when name node HA is enabled, um, the DFS client retry policy basically states that if you're a DFS client like a data node or uh, you're a region server trying to talk to a data node, um, if your primary name node is unavailable, how, does it retry or does it kind of fail over immediately? In this case, we've seen issues where if this is enabled and you have name node HA enabled and your primary name node goes down if it's killed or the machine goes away completely, having this set to true can cause a, a really high timeout on the DFS client itself. So things like your region servers, your storm bolts, anything that's basically trying to talk to HDFS can sit there and hang for roughly 10 minutes, which can be fairly problematic. So this is something that we would recommend saying this to false when you have name node HA enabled. But like I said, something that's a common configuration mistake that can cause problems only when there's a situation where your primary name node gets forcefully killed. But something to be aware of. Data node configuration. Um, so this is something that's, that's important because I see a lot of our customers setting this to zero. So like I said before, HDFS, Hadoop in general, can cope with a lot of different failure scenarios, individual disks, nodes, et cetera, things of that nature. And this specific setting dictates just how much failure should that specific data node deal with um, before it kind of goes out of rotation, before it can no longer be used. So the, the, this specific um, setting basically says of like if I have 12 disks, 
12 DFS data node data directory entries, how many of those can go away before I should no longer be used as a data node. So this is something that should be set to about 25% of the number of spindles that you have available for HDFS. If this is set to zero and any one of those specific volumes goes away, a data node can no longer be used. And you're effectively kind of destroying some of the fault tolerance that we have within the platform. So we recommend this to be 25%. But do you have a question? Yeah. And uh, I do not see the more reasons uh, of going like more than one just because if it's not fixed, it's something, some problem on that human side. Oh, totally. And going, and yeah. going out the nodes is just arising a lot. That's more, more psychological than technical. Yeah, I get, I get what you mean. Yeah, and if you guys didn't hear it, effectively, um, what you're saying is if you set this to one, it, more people will know that that disk needs to be replaced, right? Mm -hmm. And that, that makes sense. But I think what we would. Yeah, it's your problem. Yeah, this is a human problem because someone physically has to replace this drive, right? Um, but what we, I would say, prescribe is let's try to identify if these drives are about to fail or are presenting problems so that you can kind of get ahead of it instead of being caught off guard with you know, a couple data nodes being out because a couple disks failed. So these are some things to look at, meaning as um, potential problems that you should be able to see in your logs before a specific drive fails in some cases. So looking at the output of D message, you're looking for like ATA arrows, things of that nature. Those usually kind of pop up, specifically when a failure happens on a disk. But using smart CTL, so for some devices, some hard drives, we'll be able to kind of interrogate using smart CTL to identify if there's any potential problems or bad sectors, things of that nature. We recommend running that against the disk to try to identify if there's any unhealthy disks that you know have a limited lifetime and you just need to start stocking up on drives or making sure you're ready to replace that drive. So, like I said, looking at D message output from time to time, also consuming the output of smart CTL is helpful to identify has a disk fail, is a disk about to fail. So with that said, there are JMX entries that you can use on the data node itself to identify how many volumes have failed. And we do have specific alerts like within Ambari and most other vendors have it in their operational platform to say, hey, look, a, a device has failed on this data node. You need to actually do something about it. But having this set a little bit higher gives you more time to react more time to get drives, and more time for the system to be operational in the case of failure. Max transfer threads is um, one of the things that, that popped up. So this is a data node configuration. This basically specifies you know, how many threads are available within data node for data transfer activities. So data node to data node communication, DFS client to data node communication. Where this is important is the default is 4096, and this is usually okay for medium-sized clusters with you know, like things like traditional yarn, MapReduce 2, maybe some Hive workload. But if this is a very, very busy cluster, you have Storm running to HDFS, Spark running to HDFS. If you've got HBase co-located with these machines, we recommend setting this up to like 16K, something of that nature, increasing the number of threads that are available on each data node to be able to handle in inbound requests. So a lot of data node activity, a lot of um, data transfer activity, we recommend increasing this. There is a side effect to increasing this too far, specifically running out of file handlers for the HDFS user or the data node process. And so if you're going to increase this, we also recommend increasing the number of files that are uh, allowed to be opened by the HDFS user. And that's why I want to mention a couple different things. So limits, limits in general, meaning like ULimit, things of that nature, are important within the whole Hadoop ecosystem. Each of the services that we have run as different users, and those different users have at the operating system a dictated amount of number of files that can be opened, a maximum amount of memory that can be directly allocated. And those are usually stored within like um, Etsy security, limits.d, uh, things of that nature. One of the difficulties is identifying for my specific data node or node manager, what is the actual configuration? And so what I've found is if you look at proc, the PID, um, there is a specific, you can just ls that. You can look at the limits that are configured for that individual process. So instead of having to kind of dig for, okay, well, you know, what's set in limits.conf, what's in limits.d, you can just say, for the data node, what are my limits set to? Because this is important for centralized cache management on the data node itself, which is going to be doing direct memory allocation. If the data node is configured to directly allocate six gigs or whatever it might be, and it can't actually allocate that memory because the operating system is preventing it from doing so, the data node won't start. Same thing with HBase region server off-heap caches. If it's doing direct memory allocation to actually give you a bucket cache, for example, and the operating system not configured to allow you to actually do that, uh, your region server won't start. So 
U limits are important, and they are impacted by things like this setting, the max transfer threads. Um, let's start with yarn. So this is a common configuration. That's, that's one of those things where this is a calculation that changes quite frequently over time uh, as disk technology advances from traditional spinning disk to SSSDs. There's different calculations that we use. Effectively, what these two specific settings allow you to do is change, it's like an ATM, right? What's the minimum amount of money that can be pulled out? What's the maximum amount of money that can be pulled out? Because effectively, containers are like the currency of yarn. And the amount of memory that can be allocated or the increments of memory that can be allocated have a direct impact on the total capacity of you know, how many jobs you can run in the specific cluster. So this is a RM configuration, meaning it's a scheduler configuration. The minimum allocation dictates what's the smallest container size that can be actually asked for and allocated. Anything below that is effectively ignored and you just get the minimum. The maximum, same thing. That's the, the largest container you can actually allocate. Anything above that will be rejected. Why this is important is because this is a global setting, right? Um, what a lot of our customers will do is they might have larger jobs that require larger containers, but it's a situation where if you set your minimum too high, that means that everyone coming for a container that might only need a gig or two gigs will automatically getting an eight gig container. And how that works within Yarn is it's gonna allocate and say, look, eight gigabytes is being used by this guy over here, even though he's not really gonna use that eight gigabytes, which means you have less overall containers to give out to your applications, which means your overall throughput will be reduced just because you have a lot of huge containers that are not being fully you know, used or allocated. The um, other configuration is the uh, resource memory MB, and this is on the node manager itself. So if you think of the scheduler, the application goes to the scheduler and asks for containers. The containers are actually allocated and used on the node manager itself, right? That machine is going to actually use that container for some unit of work. So this is also another calculation that's based on a number of different factors. So we pre-allocate amount of memory for the operating system just to be left over, right? So at least maybe like four gigabytes uh, for the operating system. Then we actually look at the data node process itself to say how much heap size are you configured to have and do you have CCM? Same thing with the region server. What is the region server heap size that's gonna be allocated plus if there's any kind of off heap cache in use that needs to be allocated. And then the node manager heap, basically whatever's left over, you have room on that machine for allocating containers. This is something you have to be careful with because oversubscribing a specific node manager, giving it more effectively kind of containers, can you might have the memory to be able to handle that, but you might not have the CPU um, to be able to, to deal with that, or you might over allocate your disks effectively, right? So you start seeing CPU I weight increase. You have more containers in your actual disk, your IO subsystem can handle. So it's kind of a delicate balance, and this is something that little tweaks to both the scheduler of min-max as well as the memory MB have a pretty significant impact on the overall throughput of the cluster and the either under allocation or over allocation of resources. Um, the Yarn local directories is something that I think not a lot of people take into consideration. Just like in HDFS, we have our DFS data node data directories. That's basically how we would you know, spread out IO across multiple different disks for data storage. Uh, Yarn local directories is how we do that for localization of resources for Yarn applications. So if you submit a job, it has a bunch of jars that it needs for that specific job. Those jars are written to these local directories before the uh, container spun up and before it actually uh, gets invoked. What we see a lot of customers doing in this case is only using one directory for local directories, which means that every single container in that box is going to be trying to write jars to that one spindle and effectively can kind of gum up the works when it comes to getting those containers launched and ready to go. So that's why we recommend having multiple entries in the Yarn local directories, just so we're spreading out, writing that data across multiple different disks on machine. So what we would, I would say generally recommend is whatever you're using for your DFS data node data directory, the different spindles you might have for that, use some of those for the local directory, just to spread that IO out, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah, I mean, there are some dirty background ratio and things of that nature that you can tune to help with that a little bit, right? But it's minimal, you know? I think uh, when it comes to 
HBase being co-located with the data node, using things like short circuit reads can be helpful, right, to bypass the data node socket. That does a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, don't, I guess I don't have any other recommendations on how to minimize that. If you're seeing that the local directory, the, the, the local resource, um, the localization of resources is taking a lot of I.O., is that your situation? Gotcha. Then you might want to try to re re reduce the amount of directories in there, but that might directly impact your actual jobs. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about more after, maybe. Yeah. Yep. So the Yarn app timeline server is something that has been, you know, has been going through a lot of changes recently. But effectively, what this does is for every app, Yarn application, they write a lot of metrics and information to ATS. And ATS uh, traditionally has, in some cases, been kind of a bottleneck to overall performance. A lot of information is stored in this, and it was using level DB before. And there was a lot of write issues and read issues when it came to storing data within ATS. And so a lot of our customers have you know, tried, tried different things to get around those performance in, in, impact. But um, with ATS v1.5, there are some additional store classes that you can use that are optimized for um, better purging of information in ATS. So the different store classes that are available, there's a level DB timeline store, which is kind of traditionally something that you guys might be using today. But with later versions of Yarn, you can also use the Entity Group FS timeline store. And the one we recommend is a rolling level DB timeline store. Effectively, what these do for you is as data is written to um, ATS, it's effectively kind of like batching that information together so that when you have TTL enabled, which we'll talk about next, and you have an expiration time, it's easier to remove that data. Instead of going row by row and deleting individual expired rows, it's effectively like dropping individual like folders or you know, kind of databases that have expired. Much like with an Elasticsearch or Solar, it's easier to drop a collection than it is to individually expire individual records out of a collection. So next, that brings us to the time to live setting within ATS. So this is something that we recommend to have enabled just because we want to be able to purge data out of ATS uh, as it can, it's, it can be very voluminous. It can take up a lot of space on local disk. So having TTL enabled as well as having the TTL um, set up so that it expires records maybe after about 30 days is our general recommendation right now. Gives you enough information to look at when potentially things are wrong, you're doing performance related troubleshooting, you're working with support, but it doesn't keep things along um, long enough to be able to really take up a, a massive amount of space. So that, that is uh, kind of the high level of some of the different recommendations that we have, some of the different observations that we've seen. Just to kind of summarize, in every individual data node, every individual machine matters. So local operating system configuration, making sure that's consistent is extremely important because those types of issues can be extremely difficult to troubleshoot. And they're hard to reproduce, et cetera. The other thing is these recommendations that we've seen, we've only covered about 16, about the 250 rules that we have within SmartSense. And we have a lot of different rules for operating system, HDFS, HBase, Yarn, MapReduce2, Tez, Hive, things of that nature. And how this actually works is we have a kind of consistent feedback loop with engineering, with support. Every time there's a SEV1 issue, we do a postmortem, and we take that information in to say, is this something we could create a rule for our customers to get ahead of? And if it is, we create a rule for it, get it out there. Um, and it, what, how this kind of manifests itself in the products and, you know, themselves are when we have an issue, we try to turn around and say, okay, let's create a rule for it so that our customers can be notified and proactively identify those issues in customer environments. But we also use that to feed back into the, the products themselves. So Apache and Bari has a component called the, the Stack Advisor. The Stack Advisor basically allows you within Bari, if you're making these types of changes, to do these calculations on the fly, to try to look at some of these guardrails to say, hey, I know you want to be able to allocate this for memory MB, but you're going to oversubscribe these machines. But the difficulty with that is it's, those are hard coded in each software release. And we have some customers that are using like, you know, version 1.7, which is 18 months old or eight, you know, 18 months old. And it's, it's hard to be able to quickly update those specific, that advice within the product. And that's why we've kind of gone down this route, which is capture the information, take it back, and then apply a consistently updated set of rules against that so that these calculations, these recommendations can be applied really, really quickly, independent of an individual software release. But learnings that we have from the rules go back into the product, they go back into the core HDFS and Yarn, things of that nature, and then we produce new alerts. One of the things that customers or people always ask me about is if we're collecting this data, you know, how do we kind of have a conversation with our security department? Because um, they're always very concerned about what data is being sent out. But every SmartSense bundle is automatically encrypted and anonymized, and we have a flexible set of rules to anonymize different data based on regular expressions. 
So we look for things like IP addresses, FQDNs, we anonymize those, we remove any kind of clear text passwords. So those things are not captured when we do our data capture. And that data is sent back to us for recommendations. From a support perspective, we cover basically the whole HTTP stack 2.0, uh, and we integrate directly with Ambari 2.2, so it's right there out of the gate and out of the box. And that is the content that I had for you guys today. Any questions? Yes, sir. For log directories? Yeah. Meaning you, you reach like the maximum depth for that log directory? Uh, not depth. We, we got like a one million of directories. Okay. So HDFS, so we have to reconfigure how to limit for HDFS because you know this front and bottom limit. Yep. So what actually could be, a, so currently we just move them away with growth rates and whatever, but it should be like some sort of... It should be automatic. Yeah. yeah it should be some automatic. Yeah, what version of Hadoop are you running? Okay, okay. Yeah, I need to think about that, different strategies. Yeah, I don't have anything off the top of my head, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, but let's catch up after. <laughs> yep, but it can happen, yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> cool, well, thank you guys for attending. I hope you got something out of this. Like I said, every little thing matters. So, thanks everyone. <laughs> Take care.